Good to see everybody. Thanks for taking carving time out of your day to uh, come and spend a couple hours together. Talk about the, uh, the sales driven organization. Some of the challenges that you might have we'll be addressing. Some of, the, some, uh, some of you guys are, are doing great and saying, hey, how can I tweak things a little bit? And that's, that's fine too. But I'm Danny Wood. My organization is Sandler Training. We specialize in sales, sales management training for entrepreneurial driven companies and professional firms. And typically managing partners, owners of companies come to me when you know, they're, they're doing well and they say, hey, you know, Dan, if we could only have more new opportunities on a consistent basis, we could really, we could really take our business to the next level. And yet there are people who say, Dan, you know, we got a lot of meetings, we just, maybe we're just not closing them. <coughs> and yeah, ad quotes are ending up in hands of competitors and we're not getting decisions and the sales cycle's getting longer and longer and we really want to do something about that. So uh, we work with folks like that. And then there are people who say, hey, we got meetings, we got, we're, we're closing deals, but everything's price, price, price. Everything's commoditized. That's how their business is being seen by the prospects. And then yet there are people who say, hey, you know, I need to find A player salespeople. I, uh, I've got a bunch of, uh, you'll learn the definition of at leasters, or my people are in a comfort zone, or I, I, I don't have the right people to get me to where I want to go, to the vision that I have for this company. So we'll address some of those, uh, some of those issues. Uh, I, shoot, I hate when this happens. I'm so embarrassed. Lizard snuck into my pocket this morning. <laughs> Lenny loves to meet new people, loves to go to country clubs, very high-end lizard. <laughs> and Lenny was given to me by a friend of mine who was camping out west many years ago, and he found uh, Lenny on his back, a stranger color green than he, than he is now. And he, and he just loved animals, and he said, you know, I think I've I, I got to get him to the nearest veterinarian. So he takes Lenny to the nearest veterinarian, and the doctor looks at him, and he says, I, I think I see what his problem is. And he says, well, what's that, doc? And he said, well, he's not shedding his skin. Now, can anybody think back to eighth grade biology? Why do lizards shed their skin? Anybody? To grow. To grow. To grow. Very good. Very good. To grow. Now, it's a rhetorical question, but if they're not shedding their skin, what are they doing? What happens to them? They die, right? They suffocate, and they, and they die. And the same thing happens with salespeople, with owners of companies, with sales organizations. Unless they're shedding their skin, doing new things, trying new things, risking, and moving ahead, they end up losing to the competition. And the same thing happens with, with them. So Lenny likes to come along and try to just uh, help to emphasize that point. Uh, would you mind uh, holding on to, uh, to Lenny since you uh, had the first answer? He's, he's, he's low maintenance and he's good. Oh, by the way, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to raffle off a book at the end, so if you guys, you know, you can take out a business card, just leave it by you, you know, in front of you. And this book is Five Minutes with Vito. Sandler Training, we wrote a book, Five Minutes with Vito. Vito, I, I know, you know, when I give this, this talk, sometimes in other areas of the country, people say, sounds like a very interesting book. And when I do this here in North Jersey, people say, I didn't know what my cousin was doing. <laughs> I didn't know he was an author. So uh, I am going to uh, raffle off Five Minutes with Vito, which is very important top officer. And they're a different breed when speaking to some of these folks. And this will give you some tips and, and, and strategies and mindsets on how to go and, and approach some of those people. So I will, I'll be ruffling that off at the end. <clears throat> so I have a set agenda today on, on the sales driven organization. We're going to focus on how to be one. If you're not, what might you need to tweak if you already are? A lot of the folks, as I said, I deal with, they're growing year after year, very successful want to get to the next level a little bit more easily and less painfully than they got to their current level. So before I move into that, I would like to ask, what are some of the uh, challenges that you might have? What is it that you're hoping I'll address as we go through uh, our, our couple hours together here? What is it that you're, that you're hoping? Yeah. Uh, how to manage uh, independent salespeople or agents. Okay. People who aren't employees. Okay, fair enough. People who are not employees. Okay. And you had, is that what the majority of your, your folks are? The majority. Okay. Outside reps that have other lines that, yep. that don't uh, necessarily show your stuff if, if they don't have time, if there's limited time, or, or I, I don't want to assume that, but I'm, that's part of the issue usually. In most cases, we're the largest, most important line. Okay. Balancing with others. And okay. 
talking about how to push, but not push too much. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So in a, in a sense, what you might need to do, and we're going to talk a little bit about a sales process, but in a sense, what you what you need to do is have have somewhat of a selling system, in in a way for your reps. Right, so I've, I've dealt with some many distributors who have, have that type of uh, situation or manufacturers. It's interesting because you know when you have a selling system, if you have one, and most people say I don't, I don't know what you mean by a selling system. You know, I, I, you know, if I, if I, in fact, when I ask owners of companies if everybody were to write down on a piece of paper what's your selling system, most people say, well, I don't know what you mean. We we use uh, we use we use uh, Salesforce.com, right? We use Act. We use you know Sales Logics. We use and, and that's really not what we mean. CRM, got to have it, but what's your sales process? And, and often we find that we can use it internally as well in certain organizations. That's a great question, and, and let's, let's try and, uh, and address that a little bit. What else? Yes, sir, Mr. Hahn. Um, we're getting a lot of traction with meeting people and getting proposals in front of them. Mm -hmm. We seem to have sort of a verbal, yes, we want to do something, we want to make a change, we like what you're presenting, and then it slowly loses traction as you're trying, like you're there, you see it, you can feel it, smell it, taste it, mm -hmm. but they're not committing, and I just, uh, we have a lot of that situation happening. Okay. All right, and, and usually what we say when we uh, go over our selling system a little bit is it's not where you fell. See, if you have a system in place, you know what you did right, what you did wrong. You, it's repeatable, multipliable throughout your organization. But we always say it's not where you fell. So it's not where, that, that's not the problem, right? Is that, hey, we're not getting return calls now. It's, it's, it's you know, there, it's the slow no, sometimes we call it, right? Um, but it's, it's not where you fell, it's where you slipped. What could you have done prior to that that prevents that from happening? And my, my, my thought are that that's probably a few things there that we can, we can talk about a little bit. So thank you for bringing that up so I know that I can address some of these as we, as we go along. So what else? Yeah, sure. Maybe you're interested in learning new and different ways of prospecting. Okay. All right. And what are you uh, currently doing now that you might say that, that, that has... Uh, prompted you to say, I'd like to find some others. Actually, it's more just the analogy of uh, your, your friend, I forget his name over there, the lizard, when you talked about... Oh, my friend, yeah. I knew I had one friend in the when room. When you talked about yeah. needing to do new and different things, yes. that's really what prompted you. Okay, fair enough. Is there anything that we're not doing yep. that's more... Okay. And sometimes it becomes what we're doing, how do you do that more effectively, right? <coughs> Which is uh, something I believe we can talk a little bit more about as well. Very good. What else? Everybody else is here because they're playing golf after, or they're, you know, I got dragged here, I didn't know I was getting going here. Um, what else? Give me a couple more things just so that I, uh, so that I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, Matt. Double dip it. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm teasing. All right, yeah, I asked. Yeah, yeah. Teach me. We have, we're bringing on newer, younger, developing salespeople. Yep. And um, I think having uh, a better, uh, goal, it's a more specific type goal, but mm -hmm. if you're someone who's green, mm -hmm. so someone who's coming into a new industry, mm -hmm. you have expectations, but you're not going to have the same expectations of success as you would with someone who's seasoned with the book of business that they can go to. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's a double-edged sword in a way, because I can't tell you the amount of times, and I'm sure you have all seen it and experienced it, and we will talk about that, but so often we say, let's bring somebody in that has a book of business, and then you stand there and you go, I can't believe, what, so, so where is this business, right? And we call that a merger or an acquisition sometimes, and you know, you bought that, and here you are, and how come they're not out doing it now? And I'm going to get into what's in the si in, inside, bet between the ears of people's situation in life, and what's going on inside their head, and that's what you got to smoke out before you hire people, because a lot of the issues go away, not all, but when you hire the right people. And so we have to take the time on how do we do that? How do we do that differently? And I'll make a few suggestions on, on how to do that. But we can't settle. It's not easy. Oh, I, I can't tell you the amount of times. Dan, I was going to, I was going to, I was actually going to use you. But my competitor went out of business and they got all these veteran salespeople that I'm going to hire. And I'm going to be on easy street. And that doesn't last too long. And there's high salaries. And, uh, and it's not a good place to be. I mean, I used to be in the garment business 
for many years, and we couldn't sell Target. How are we going to sell Target? You know, we hired somebody, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because she sold Target, and she never sold Target. You know, so but there are many many reasons behind that. But it's it's so how do you how do you build? How do you grow? That's that's part of what managers need to do. That's a sales driven organization. Thinking about it, living it, breathing it, growing it to be better than it was the month before. Not. I hired them from a company that said salesperson on their card, they should know what they're doing. Because you don't know what the background was and how they got there. So, so fair enough. Anything else, John, were you going to add at all? Well, I think you guys you know, basically covered it, but you know, as you're very well aware, because you're already helping me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you, you know, find those individuals that are the right individual mm -hmm. uh, who are actually going to get up in the morning and go out and work? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the culture today is, Oh hey, how much are you? How much are you going? How much are you going to pay me? Eh, you know what? I think I'll try that. Yeah. Maybe that'll work for me. Exactly. Where instead of them coming in and saying, "Hey, you know, let me show you what I can do for you," then we'll <laughs> talk about money afterwards. You never hear that these days. Right. Right. So, yeah. So uh, you know, okay. how do you find the right people to get up? You know, hire, motivate them, get them up in the morning, go out, spend the full day, kick some butt, and right. bring some business back into okay. the organization. Fair enough, and that's. And, uh, and that's like, uh, that's, yeah, so often the owners always say, why can't I find people like me, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, why can't I find more? Yeah. How to motivate <coughs> commodity salesmen into value added. Okay. Maybe you could just uh, expand on that for a moment, please. Um, you know, in our company, we have products that have a lot of value that cost more up front, but you save in the end. Yes. And we, have, we also have a ton of commodity. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people find that commodity as alcohol is a dialing for dollars. They pick up the phone, what are you paying? Mm -hmm. You know, that's not how we really like to sell. We like exactly. to go in front of the customer. Absolutely. Uh, show them what we have. Show, you know, do cost analysis mm -hmm. and, uh, and show them value added. Mm -hmm. Why they're dealing with us. Why they're using this product instead of a commodity product. Yep, yep. And that's what we really, Al and I work hard on all the time. Mm -hmm. Particularly Al, trying to get the salespeople out of the cold, the lazier end of just selling the commodity. What's your price? What's your price? Yeah. And one, it's a little harder to get in on the value added, but once you're in, it's a lot easier to stay in. Mm -hmm. You're in plastics. Yes. And, and I'm sorry. And packaging. And packaging, yes. And uh, are, do you have a veteran sales force? Yes. Okay. Both. So. Both veteran and non-veteran? Correct. Okay. Well, you say it with a smile on your face for a reason. Oh, okay, okay. And they're being successful. Some are. Okay. Okay. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Something behind that question. Uh, <laughs> family member? Uh, all right, it's just going somewhere. Uh, Huh? Good. Well, that's good because uh, sometimes it's the other way. What am I going to do? My, my, my partner's kid. Yeah. All right. So fair enough. So let's move on a little bit and feel free to. Uh, it's interactive. If you uh, have a question as we're going through this, yeah, please feel free to uh, to speak up. Not a problem. So I uh, just want to start with uh, with, 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 with uh, again focus on really the misalignment between where the owners of a company want to go and the sales organization. So certainly we have a vision. Certainly as the owner of a company you have a vision. And that vision might be I hear different things from different people. Hey, I'm at a certain age and I got 10 years, 15 years, whatever. I want to I want to maximize this thing and sell this thing. Uh, I've got others where, you know what, I got to grow this thing and be successful because I have a lot of family members in the, in, in the business and I've got kids that are going to be in the business and, for, for, and we have other, other visions. Just build it to sell it. Wh whatever it is that you'd like to do, my guess is that you have a vision. And followed by that vision, you probably have sat down with someone and, had a, and put together a strategic plan. Hey, what's the plan? How are we going to go and actually execute this thing? How are we going to do this? What are the X's and O's of all the areas of my company? Manufacturing and staffing and and all these types of things. Where do you want to be five, ten years? You have a strategic plan. And then what happens is it falls apart a little bit because we've got this plan, but we really don't have one for the sales organization. And there are different components that we need to have in order for us to 
reach our, achieve our, our vision through our, through our plan. And it seems to fall apart. And what I'm going to share with you with our time together here are some areas where it does seem to fall apart and some suggestions on what you can do to make a difference because when they are aligned together you're going to really see your business thrive. So you might just want to for a moment grade yourself on where do you think your sales organization is as far as it's how aligned is it with your strategic plan. Here's my plan, here's how we're operating, how aligned are you? Scale of 1 to 10. I'm not asking for your answer, but it's something that you might want to just consider. So let's talk about the four S's of sales. And we're going to address each one of these in depth a, a little bit. But first we have strategy. And so often when I see folks, they come to me, which is great because we got some great skill stuff that we'll talk about, but they say, you know, my people need training. Train them to pick up the phone, train them to close a deal, train them to ask tough questions, how to handle stalls and objections. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but what's your sales strategy? Are you, it has to be aligned with, we have to have the right people with the right skills to execute what you want executed. For example, do you want somebody who is going to just go and sell a lot of volume? Or do you want somebody who's going to sell on margin? We'll talk about that in depth a little bit. Do you want somebody who wants to grow current customers? Or do you want somebody who's going to go hunt for new ones? What percentage mix do you want? It's different people with different skills. But what's the strategy? If we, if we don't know where we're going and where, where we want to go and how we're going to get there, there's going to be a misalignment. We need to talk a little bit about our sales organization structure and process. In other words, how do you hold people accountable? What's your accountability system? What are you holding them accountable to? Are you meeting in the hallway and say, how's it going? Oh, we get reports. I look at their sales force every now and then. and. They're not making the calls. I mean, I don't know if that's what you call accountability. I see in most entrepreneurial driven companies that might be what we, what we see. What's your pre-call strategy and post-call debriefing process? What's your hiring process? Or do we put an ad in the, in, in, no, it wouldn't be the paper, do we, do we, we do a LinkedIn now, right? We do a LinkedIn, right? Craigslist, and I know, I, I know that we can have, you can have some success in that, but you gotta, you gotta do it all, right? So what's your processes? What do, you, what do you have in place that you can, that you're holding people accountable, that you've, sales management process. I mean, I think the fact of the matter is that most people became sales managers because they were the best salesperson, or they were in the industry the longest, or they became partners with somebody and said, you know what, you, I'll do finance and operations, you do sales. And so they never necessarily learned how to be a good manager. Some people even have, and, and I think it's great, you know, MBAs in business and whatnot, and, but, but how do they communicate with their people, talk to their people, motivate their people? And what they don't learn are the, 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 the streetwise, relevant, real world ways to, to communicate with people. And I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. How do you connect with your folks? We're good? Okay. Staff, do you have the right people to take you where you want to go? And how do you know? And how do you know? Are you people in a comfort zone? Do you have most of your people in what we call uh, the frozen middle? They're not doing terrible? You know what, they're, uh, they're not costing me that much money, they break even sometimes, I make a little money on them. Uh, or are they not going to cover off the ball? Who do you have? Are they in a comfort zone? Do you have people and do you know before you hire them, do they want to learn and grow? Do they want to learn and grow? Ah, what are you sending me to this for? Ah, you know, I, you know what, what's the last book that anybody ever read in order to develop themselves? I mean, I was at a company once, we were doing a sales meeting, and, and by the way, sales meetings, do you have good motivational sales meetings that are well planned and, and, and with interactiveness and, and, and or, or do you, 
you just have meetings where everybody gets together and you talk about a new product and where are all the leads coming from? You know? That would solve our problem, those kinds of meetings. So I don't mean to make it so, I know that a lot of you do a lot of good things, but I'm just saying some of that is out there also. And then the skills. Do you have the people who can have relevant conversations with decision makers? Who can have the skills to get through gatekeepers? Who can bond and build rapport and create relationships? Who can find out what their, uh, the decision making process of an organization is? Who can ask, hey Matt, I appreciate you saying that you want to move forward with us, but can I ask you a question before I go? What, if anything, can go wrong where we would not be getting this business? Would you mind just sharing that with me? You know, I'm just saying people that can stand up, plant their feet, and ask tough questions to people. Because my biggest fear, we have this little rule, when something happens to you three or more times, we call it your biggest fear. Hey Matt, here's my biggest fear. Often when I'm sitting with the owner of a company and they say, hey, things look good, we want to move forward with you, I find that something falls through the cracks somewhere along the way. How do we see ourselves preventing that from happen happening? I mean, I'm, so I'm just giving you a little something there that somebody needs to plant their feet, have the millionaire attitude. How many, how many of you guys, let me ask you a question. Would you, there are so many salespeople have commission, what we call commission breath. I need the business. I'm going to make the quote. I'm not going to ask the tough question because it's a quote. And you know, if I throw enough stuff up against the wall, something's going to stick. Or would you act differently if you had, I don't know, I, I don't have my glasses on. But I have what? Is that a million or a thousand? A million. million. One, two. Leave it at 10 million. If you had 10 million in the bank and didn't need the business, would you act differently? Right? Would we say, hey, I'm not going to waste my time? Not in a cocky manner. Not in a cocky manner, but would we be, would you say, I'm not going to, we're not going to waste our time. I'm going to ask tough questions and, and we're going to find out if this is a real fit here. So we always say, act as if you got 10 million in the bank and you don't need the business. But salespeople who have commission breath are out there doing quotes and proposals and, 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 and every opportunity is a good opportunity and and so that, again, that's what we mean by, by also back to sales process. Do you, have you guys identified the top five or ten questions that your salespeople need to ask on every sales call? And when they come back to the office or you talk to them on the phone, they have to have the answer to those five. Start with five or ten questions. You have that. What's that? Oh, post point. Okay, that they need to come back with or there is no quote or there is no proposal. So those are some of the things we'll talk about a little bit. But skills, so many people focus on skills, it's important, it is. If you have the right people and you're and you, and you holding them accountable and, you, you, and everybody's clear on where you're, where you're going. So the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but it's too low and we reach it. So I've got uh, many companies that I work with, uh, owners of, of companies, they'll come in and you know, we talk about this and, and then they're successful. And sometimes they just bang their hand on the table and they go, you know what? Because I mentioned this term called at leasters, which is mediocrity. They settle for mediocrity. Again, not, not killing it, not the worst in the industry, but they're somewhere in the middle. Because life is good. I mean, life is very good for, for many, many successful owners. And they say, you know, in fact, one guy came in, owner of a, yeah, it was a, I guess, $40 million distribution company, came in with his executive team, put a little PowerPoint together, and he said, I'm a member of AA. And they go, oh, gee, was, uh, we didn't know that. He said, yeah, at least there's anonymous. Tired of being an at leaster. Tired of it. Tired of hearing excuses. Tired of, of, uh, of, 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 of covering up a lot of things. I'm tired of bringing in all the leads. I'm tired of, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So anyway, um, the frozen middle. A lot of times people are just stuck in the middle. One guy came back from a trade show. I said, how'd it go? He goes, it's pretty good. I go, why? He wasn't a client of mine, though, by the way. I said, why was it good? He goes, because oh, business sucked for everybody. <laughs> I said, well, you know, somebody's going to get the business. It, 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 might as well, it might as well be you, right? Right? Is your head in the right place? I mean, do your salespeople have the attitude of, you know, I read a book, um, 
The Art of Possibility. I don't know if anybody ever read it, but the, part of your job is helping your salespeople to put their head in the right place every day. Because not everybody, even the best salespeople, are not self-starters every day. Putting their head in the right place. But there was a book called The Art of Possibility. I talked about these, uh, I thought it was an interesting story. Two people went out to uh, Africa. They sent two executives out to Africa. And uh, one of them started, uh, took out the iPhone and said, this is ridiculous. You know, they were in the shoe business. They were thinking about expanding a line of shoes. This is ridiculous. Somebody sent me all the way out here, and nobody wears shoes. What do you think the other person was sending back? Great opportunity. Great opportunity. No wearing Nobody's wearing, wearing shoes, wearing. right? So sometimes we, our salespeople, for various reasons, set our targets very low. And we have to work on our people with them and to get inside their head and to determine why those targets are where they are. I think quotas, when you just give them to someone, hey, here's where we want to go as a company this year, you know, that's, that's nice, but that's what you guys want to do. That's not going to necessarily help me. How many people here know the goals and dreams of your salespeople? How many people here know the, the personal goals of your salespeople and the dreams that they have? That's what's in it for them. You have your vision of what you want to achieve. Do you know what it is that they want to achieve? And that's tapping into, that's motivation. Not we're looking for a 10, 15% growth this year or whatever it is, we're gonna remain, remain even or whatever, whatever, we're planning, whatever you're doing. What is it? Okay, so here's where I'll need a little help from you. The typical sales force is 17% effective on an average day to day. So what do you think some of those, and I don't have the exact five. I've got a list, but I'd like to know what do you guys think are the five contributing factors that might make a sales force, uh, sales force 17% effective on a, on a given day? What are they? Why are they only 17%? Uh, yep? You're spending a lot of time trying to find Call. Okay, okay. That'd be my guess. Yeah, well that's, okay, and that's something we, we also are going to address, but that's called, and this always comes up at this point in the presentation, that's called, is that pay time activity or no pay time activity? No pay time activity, right? The person who wants to earn the money is doing it on the weekend, or they're doing it early in the morning, and they're having their list ready to roll by the time they come in. And so, you know, working on lists and, and doing research, you know, it takes a lot of time. Now, sometimes you've got to call and research during the day, but, you know, it shouldn't be all day. And that's what, that's what we call avoidance behavior, working on my list. What else? That was a good one, though. Very valid and true. What else? I think Personal we'll, issues. We'll work, right. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, and then we'll work right, right, right here. Yep. Personal issues. Personal issues. Yep. Texting. I have an inside company I work with, inside Salesforce. The guy, you have to, they have, one girl has to check her phone now, <laughs> you know, it, 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 in another department because she'll just be sitting there all day long. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And she does good when, when, when she's on the phone. But that's, that's part of it. It's a problem. Well, Personal I think issues. With our company, the <laughs> primary factor is administrative responsibilities that the salespeople have. Yep. And they do, I, I like the vision of a, of a pure selling day. Yes. You have you know, everything is set up for the salesman. All they have to do is stand up in front of the customer and practice their art. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, there's so many administrative burdens put on salespeople today. And if they don't have them, they find them, like sitting at their desk and counting their invoices and their commission statements because, God, we can't trust the company to yes. my commissions. Yes. Right. Um, That's what they end up doing. It goes on and on and on. And right. they're just excuses for failure. They are. And they set themselves up for failure. Correct. And uh, I, I would say that 17% is actually high. <laughs> you know, okay. I like to, to think that my salespeople can be successful 30 to 40%, mm -hmm. providing they have the right business plan to start the year off, mm -hmm. they have the right time and territory management plan, mm -hmm. they have their target accounts or prospects well planned in advance, mm -hmm. they have their pre-call analysis where they've qualified those customers, mm -hmm. and then they can just initiate, the, you know, implement the plan. Mm -hmm. And we try to peel away the burden of administrative responsibilities we set up a sales service department that mm -hmm. takes a lot of that burden off of the salespeople mm -hmm. so they can focus on pure selling. Mm -hmm. um, well, that sounds like a great, in, in, in reality, uh, you know, in the real world, a great thing to do. 
uh, what happens, I, I believe, is that the the, the, the makeup of a, of a human being, you know, the, the, this is where we get into a little bit of the psychology. All that is great that you provide that and let them, you know, that you, you, you prepare them to succeed. But there are some things that go on between the ears, like, for example, uh, need for approval. You know, if a salesperson has a high need for approval, they want to be friends with everybody and they become sometimes professional visitors, you know, and they're out and, you know, how many times are you going to see somebody and be friends with somebody but not get any more business? Or they don't want to pick up the phone. I know all that. I know my plan. I know who I need to see. But they have call avoidance and they start flipping invoices so I don't have to make the call because I don't want to hear from somebody the word no. In fact, in our training, what we share with people is a goal is to go out and get me I'll make up a number, 20 no's today. T come tell me that 20 people told you no. Because it's a lot less pressure. And when somebody has pressure to get up to get yeses, I don't know if I, don't know if I could do it because I failed if I don't get a yes, but heck, I could get a no. And when I, go, when I go for a no, I could also have the millionaire attitude because I don't have to beg anybody. I could do things that are what we call the opposite of what a traditional salesperson would do and call somebody and have a regular conversation. Hey Kyle, I don't know if we should even be speaking. I, I gotta tell you, you know, we, we help a lot of, lot of, lot of companies with their, with their wealth management, with their, with their 401k plans or with, with whatever it might be. And my guess is that a successful business like yours, David, you're, you're probably covered. So I could go for the no. And somebody might say to me, hey, you know, you're not such a pushy guy. You know, well, I wouldn't say that. You can always do better. I can say, well, how so? So my point is, if you go for the no, but that brings me back to what you, what you guys are saying. If somebody has a high need for approval and they have a territory plan and everything is, is, is set up for them, they're still, still probably not going to go out and prospect. If they have what we call a, a we, something that we call the buy cycle, the way we sell something, pardon me, the way we buy something, is a direct reflection of how we sell something. Here's what I mean. We may have grew up in a household where money was scarce, where we shopped every single store before we went and we purchased something. And we did a lot of research. What happens now when you're selling something? That same belief, undertow, I'm just, I just the first time I thought of that, but I kind of like it, is, 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 uh, is, 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 is sucking us back out to, the, to our behavior. So you got somebody that interviewed that's in a suit and looks great or suit, whatever, whatever they're wearing. Gingham checks are fine. Um, but if, <laughs> but, that they're, um, but they're, they're, so they're sitting there, you know, and they're looking good and they're saying the right things, but when, it's, when they're really out there, that's the stuff that's coming out. Because when we're fearful or we're or afraid or, or when we have pressure, we go back to, we revert back to our our, our natural way of, of behaving. So until a company really works on what's inside the head of somebody, you know, it's transformational, it's a change, it's over time. You know, we, we say it's like training a sales athlete or a sales musician. People don't go out in one day, you don't go out and say, hey, you know what, you just learned how to play uh, golf, you know that, I played with you the other day, right? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> told me I look good, but I can't play. So, uh, and that was kind. So, um, but the fact is that uh, we don't get in shape in a day. We don't learn a musical instrument in a day. We don't learn to sell in a day. And we don't change in a day. And that's what our job is as managers, is to help our people grow and learn. And, you know, if your way is to beat somebody over the head with a stick, and that, you know, that's not how it, that, how, what motivates them, then, you know, that's what's gonna. That's that's what you'll keep on doing. So we'll talk about different things. But any other factors? Self-limiting beliefs is another one. You know, I uh, can't ask for referrals. I uh, I have to have a long sales cycle. That's another problem. People hire people that come. Hey, I'm just gonna make this up. But you know, I'm selling uh, something that's a a a, um, a sales cycle that's relatively short. Let's say if somebody's selling that. And then you bring somebody on and you go, you know something, Tony? They sold capital equipment. 
they sold an order, they, they would get 200,000 to a million dollar pieces of business. A couple times a year. If they could do that, they could sell trucking for $1,800. They could sell a shit, you know. But there's a big disconnect because that person expects a long sales cycle. Make sense? That person says, well, that's too quick. I mean, let's, what else do you need? <laughs> so there's a big disconnect. Oh, so I would ask you this. I would ask you, um, in other areas of your company, what if accounting was 90% accurate? Would you keep your firm? Would you keep the firm? No. What if manufacturing was 75% effective? There's a problem. What if your people, your folks didn't answer the phone half the time? So why do we accept it in salespeople? Why do we accept the fact that they're not being the best that they could be? So consider this. Any questions so far? Making, making sense? With some of the uh, little tidbits here or there that we're, that we're covering? Okay. So strategy. Revenues. Margin. Which one are you going for? Do your salespeople know? Do your salespeople know which one you're going for? Because sometimes people just want to get the business, we'll buy the business, we're going to, we're going to, and, oh, here's, so I go to an organization, they bring me in, and I sit with about eight salespeople and the owner, construction related business. And they said, we're going to bring in Dan and he's going to help us. I, he said, they introduced me, I said, guys, what I want to help you do is to help get the right business. This, this is what happened. This is what they did. God bless you. Veterans and new people. Hey, Dan, anybody who writes a check is the right business? Ah, and they all laughed. And I just stood there. And the owner said, you know why he's here? He said, because your orders are at 19%. We're going to go out of business with your orders. You know, your orders, we don't make money on your orders. All the change orders and the fact that you don't stand up to people and I come in on the weekends and I'm, you're waiting for your commission checks for a couple months. Why? Because you guys aren't strong enough. You know, you, 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 you're you taking the lowest price, then there's a change order, then I'm not, then I'm losing money, then I got to hold back your check, then I got, you know, so, oh, they're, they're, they're very, very profitable now. Very. And they changed their business around. But these folks didn't even understand that. So they were going for revenue they were going for vanity instead of sanity. So what about market share? Do you have the right people to help you grow market share? Or do you have the right people that are going to help you to grow within your customer base? Different skill set. We'll talk about that. You have a hunter? Or you got somebody that's a really good at growing the business. But that's a strategy that you have to let your folks know. Do we want to gain wallet share of our cu current customers? Or do we want to have somebody to go out and do it again and, and, and grow our market? And when you're hiring somebody and you're looking at resumes and you see all that wishy-washy stuff that says, grew, grew territory, well, how much and how? And, and, and you've got to dig into some of those questions. But anyway, that's something for you to consider. And do your folks know? What about... How many new accounts do you want to open up? Sometimes I meet with companies, they go, listen, you know, we're going to live with somebody for a long time. If you could just open up some new accounts, I don't care what the order is, that's good for us because we're going to grow and we're going to nurture and that's okay. But do people know what they're looking for? Or do you just want to focus on existing accounts? Products and services, what you guys brought up, which is a very good point. We have something we call burn your bridges. Burn, not your bridges in relationships. But bridges, the bridge of hope, the bridge of reliance, it's the other one. Hope, reliance, and comfort. Burn your bridges of hope, reliance, and comfort. Because it's comfortable to sell the same product. I know I'm going to get my check. I know I'm not going to get fired. I know I'm going to make the minimum. I know at least I'm going to sell that. Uh, calling on the same industries, calling on the same level of an organization, it's a, it's, it's, we've got to burn those bridges of reliance, of comfort, and of hope. And guess what? We need to burn those bridges as managers and owners, too. Okay? We need to burn those bridges as well. 
I don't know, is this stuff making sense? Where we, uh, I'm kind of on a rant, but I, I, I rather I have some interaction. Thoughts? Helpful so far? Make sense? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a big boy. If it's not, please tell me. Okay? Go for the no. Uh, but I can. So, sales and marketing initiatives. You know, what is the role of marketing in your company? Is the role to, for awareness? Is the role to expand? Is the role to defend, protect your, your, your current market share? What is the role of marketing? And does that help? Is that aligned with your sales force and with the skill level and the people that you have? Do you need hunters or is marketing supposed to be providing leads? I mean, sometimes there's a, there's a big disconnect. And then it comes down also to channel partners, alliances, partnerships, reps. I think there's a head trash or, or you know, a belief that people say, I can't hold my independent reps accountable. Uh, you know, I, I can't. They're independent. They don't care. They're on their own. Or, you know, they, they don't work for me. Um, but I, I believe setting up accountability and what are the requirements and, and, and expectations and what, what are negative consequences if it doesn't happen? I think those are all fair. And I don't think a lot of people do that. And we're going to talk about accountability and, and, and such coming up. But this is probably one of the easiest places you can go and grow your business by developing better relationship, by holding them accountable, setting expectations. What are the, uh, in real estate, what are the, what are the, what are the, um, what are those, the three words in real estate, the three most important words in real estate? Right. And what do you think it is in accountability? Accountability, 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 right? Speci specificity, specificity, specificity. You know, what is it that specifically are the requirements? And you know, I saw an interesting, I was reading an Inc. magazine once, and I like this quote. I shared it, we have a sales management program, and I shared it with my folks. And it said, not holding somebody as account accountable is an act of selfishness on the manager's part. Why do you think it might say that? Not holding somebody accountable is an act of selfishness on the manager's part or the leader's part. It allows poor performance from the salesperson. Exactly. <clears throat> and and, does, and because, because I can't get over, you know, need for approval, salespeople have it, so do managers. Now, I know some folks don't have it. Some people have probably are on the opposite. But... Uh, I didn't call anybody out, did I? Is, is, uh, I'm teasing. We need to be, we do need to be, we do need to be, um, to, hold, to, hold, to, hold, uh, to hold people accountable and to be, and to, to set the specifics on, on what we need to do. And I think that's important. Yep. How do you do that and keep the guy motivated? Okay. Well, we, we got, let's get into motivation in a little bit, yeah, on, on how to do it. But, we, but you must be bringing it up for a reason. So you're holding someone accountable and they're just, eh, not important to me, or or what? I mean, how how do you um, you know hold them accountable mm -hmm. to you know whether they they hit their quota or didn't hit their quota? Okay. And by the same you know at the same time motivate them and keep them you know keep them in a positive frame of mind. Okay. So you know their dreams and their personal goals. Mm -hmm. You do know that. Okay. All right. And you have okay. The only thing you can hold somebody accountable to is the behaviors not the results. If they're not doing the behaviors, the results aren't coming. And in fact, the article that I sent you guys, I don't know if you had a chance to read it in the insurance business, you know, what are those things on a weekly basis that you're holding people accountable to? That's, if you don't hold people accountable to doing behavior, the results are not coming. They're not. Because that's what comes first. So we're not holding people accountable to numbers of results. We're holding people accountable to what needs to be done to meet those results. And when that's not there, because you're just managing history if you're looking at the number for the month. You're not managing, if you're not managing the, the activities that need to be done, then it's no surprise. Now if they're doing the activities and the results aren't coming, it could be a technical issue or a head trash issue. So those are the things, that's what we, that's what we mean by, by managing. And um, Yeah, so when you do that, you, you certainly want to be caring, but you want to be candid, both caring and candid. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about strategy. Do you have hunters? 
Do you need hunters? Yes. <clears throat> yes, we have hunters and farmers. Okay. And hunters are people who are going to go out and find it, but they also might not know how to close it. Or if they close it, they might not know how to keep it. So, different skill set. Hunters, farmers. Here's one. Account managers. We do evaluations of sales forces. We give uh, some, uh, some assessments and things like that of, of, of folks. And I went in to see the owner of a company once and he said, you know, this is a bunch of hogwash. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because you just took this report and you told me that my best salesperson is my worst salesperson. And I, I said, well, why do you think he's your best salesperson? He said, well, look for yourself. Take a look at this Excel spreadsheet over here. I said, yeah. He said, it's the biggest number there is. I said, okay. Well, let me ask you a question. When you first, when you, when you were by yourself growing these accounts, did you get so busy that you had to give this account to this salesperson? He goes, absolutely. And he grew it. I said, well, he's a great account manager. He's, a, he's got a great skill set for an account manager. He couldn't find one and open one, but he can keep one and grow one. But that doesn't mean he's your best salesperson. It means he's your best account manager. So, you know, there's different, I, I can, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen it, but most people, when they, you know, hey, I, I, you know, you ever see this one? You take a technical person and, you know, and you go along on all the sales calls with people, you know the business, and then they say, you know what, let's put sales engineer on your card. And then they end up getting a big order, growing the business with support of the company, and then they go to another company and they interview. And they say, this is the business that I got. And they go, oh my gosh, come on board. And, and then all of a sudden, they can't, that they don't have the skill set to do it. So take a look before you're, before you're hiring, value sellers. Do they have that skill set? Can they plant their feet? I tell you what, if you have a high need for approval, you're probably not going to be a value seller. Because the first thing you're going to hear is, what's your price? Right? Are they a closer? Some people close deals, but then they can't keep them. And that's a problem. And that was in that article also about insurance. The, the biggest fear is that I get somebody, they close business, but we've got so many other lines that we can sell them, and they're not good at keeping the relationship going. So they close something. But next year at renewal time, they won't be ours, because that person is good at going and closing. Territories. It's not so common sense. So to, to address that, yeah, so please. To find that you need different people for the different components, or um, are those skill sets that can be grown so you, you can have somebody who does all of it? I mean, obviously, it depends, right. I guess, different for each business, but you know, based on your experiences, yes. how do you like to break it down when you're working with sales sure. organizations? Well, I, I think there are, there are some people I, I believe you, you know, depending on their, their makeup, if they have a, you know, an uh, the most important thing is the desire, the commitment, taking responsibility, and a positive outlook. Four most crucial elements for success. And if you can, if you can go and, and, uh, and find people with that, you can grow them, I believe. But I think there are some people who may never pick up the phone, and I think you're doing them a favor by, by not you know, having them have the anxiety of, of being out and hunting and, 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 and all the energy that you have because that's just not who they are. But I, that's why my suggestion is one may want to evaluate some of the salespeople in their company you know, and, and take a look at what you got so that you know not everybody's the same and people need different things and people are going to grow different ways and, and that's just the makeup of it. So, technology, products, Right? Some of us here are into technology business, CRMs, these, these types of things. Um, different types of accounts. I mean, you guys, I heard a nice story the other day, quite frankly, from the guy in your, because you have one of the guys in the program, but Matt, he's a good guy, comes in early, wants to learn, speaks up, you know, he's not a hostage. You know, you don't want somebody who's a hostage. That's what happens. You want somebody who comes in who's really into it. And he said, I said, you have a success in our class yesterday? Just you happen to be here, so I'll share it with you. So he said, yeah, I have one. I said, well, what's that? I mean, he's only in the program for a couple of weeks. But he said, I, I, was, I learned a little bit the other day that I could not get along with a certain type of customer. And I said, you know what? Let me hand it to a lady who sits next to me. 
who is going to bond with this other person. And he said, I considered it a success because my ego was on the line. And I said to myself, you know what, I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to win this, but I'm not going to let it get to me either. For the benefit of the company, because the, the week prior we learned a little bit about self-esteem and everything, and he said it was taking a hit on my self-esteem. I couldn't get along with this person, no matter what I did. And he said I didn't get emotionally involved, I handed it to somebody else for the betterment of the company, and they're running wild with it. So I just like, I, I, that's the kind of person that can learn and grow and, and, and you know, get somewhere. Target criteria. I, I got to tell you, if you you ask, I, I, even you salespeople, try it. Ask your salespeople. Identify who's your ideal client. Who's your ideal client? See if they could tell you. Do they know who that is, so they can go and get referrals from other people? Can they describe it? Who's your ideal client? Not anybody who needs energy efficiency. Anybody who needs HR services. Anybody who needs financial planning. That ain't it. Right? Mine are closely held businesses. Owner either owns the building or has a significant amount of office space, drives a nice car, and has a spot right, right, right in front. You know, I mean, I, can you describe that? What is, what is yours? Right? So, you know, you know, and somebody who's strong-willed and wants to get to the next level and cares about their people. I always, that's how I describe it, and cares about their people. Because if they don't care about their people, forget it. So, are you getting referred to the right places? Can your salespeople, who are your targets? Can you describe them? Anybody who ships goods? Well, that doesn't help me think about it. Okay, sales management. A lot of times people are very good supervisors. Supervise, when they think of management, they think of supervising. And when they think of supervising, they think of numbers and a clipboard and wh how fast you're doing it and where you're going and how we're doing. And, and that's okay because that's an important part of setting expectations. How are you at coaching your people? What is coaching? Training, educating, nurturing. I mean. Okay. Because there is, there's a difference between all four of these, right? So training would be helping them learn a new skill. Coaching is how do I apply it? How do, how do I apply it? But coaching is not, here's how you do it. I'm just saying, because people hate, role playing is very, very good if done in a very nurturing way. Think about, think about that. If you're not role playing, how many, a little statistic for you, some of you might know it, a football is actually in play out of the whole 60 minutes how, how much how much is that football how many minutes is that ball really in play eight minutes, eight minutes. you heard my class the other day no uh, eight minutes look at the preparation that goes into those eight minutes off-season training routines practices every day of the week Studying the film, practicing, I, and yet in sales, hey, anybody uh, practicing at all? No, no, go on a sales call, see how I do. I mean, it's, it's not, we're professional, it's a profession. I always tell people, would, would you hire a CPA, let's just say that you were getting audited. Would you hire a bookkeeper? Would you hire a CPA? What if you're being sued? Would you hire a... Uh, a paralegal? Or would you hire somebody, an attorney who passed the bar? Well, why would you hire a salesperson who picked up some stuff somewhere along the way and read a few books? It's a profession. So, coaching and taking the time to do that. I mean, you guys hire coaches for Fortune 500 companies. That's how much they care. Fortune 500 companies hire these guys, call these guys, these, so that they hire coaches for people who are now getting promotions, right? J and J, you know, hey, you know what, you, you got an MBA and a doctorate and this and that, but you know what? You better learn to manage somebody here, <laughs> you know, how to get along with your people, how to motivate people. 
So coaching, you're right, it, it, you know, it is caring and, and it, is, it is helping. But you know what, if you're a sales manager, I don't have time for that. How about this one? Let's get together and have a meeting. Ah, you know what, I don't have time, a uh, customer called. Oh, hey, uh, yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're not coaching anybody. Our job is to grow people. And 85% of our time needs to be doing these things. And when you're mentoring, how about this one? How's this for a mentoring program? Anybody ever do a mentoring program? You're going to work around? What's the problem with that? You're going to go with Kyle or with Harry. He's going to mentor you. And then you're driving along with, with Harry and he's like, let me tell you how you get this thing done in this company. Don't listen to a damn word they say. <laughs> let me, let me. Hey, he's the mentor. <laughs> right? And so the fact is that you've got to, if, you, if you're going to mentor somebody, you've got to be the person that, you've got, you got to be that person that the person wants to be like. Does that make sense? 85% of a sales manager's time, and I know a lot of you guys are player coaches, so to speak, because you're, you're, you're selling and you're, and you're, you coach, and, and you're managing. So you've got to figure that out, right? Got to spend time with the, with the people to, to do that. Talk about hiring, interviewing, and recruiting. That's the other part you need to be spending your time on. Good sales managers always have their line in the water. Even when everything is good and you got, you got enough, you got good people. Always looking for something better. Always having a bench. Always having your line in the water. Questions at all? It's quiet. So it's either quiet because you're taking some stuff in, thinking, or whoo, when's he going to stop talking? What are you going to apply so far? Anybody? Yes. Okay, I know I'm going to ask my uh, person back to the office, who's our ideal client? I'm going to task them with that, see if they can identify who the ideal uh, customer is and why. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, John? Um, I like the idea of uh, finding out what you know, their personal goals are. Okay. You know, uh, and, uh, and then holding them accountable to those goals. So that's okay. one of the things, one of the first things we're going to do when Okay, that's important. Very good. Okay. So, I think we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but if I have good salespeople, they don't need sales managers, they're A players, right? If I have good people, what do they need me for? They should be selling. And it's really not true. Because what you need to do is have a development plan for them. And when you assess your people and you bring somebody on prior to hiring them, they need, they're going to have weaknesses and we need to work on those weaknesses. We need to grow people. That's our job. I hear this a lot. It's like babysitting. I don't want to be a micromanager. And that's why I say it's an act of selfishness because you're not helping, you're really not helping them. So Dan, when you get, yeah. get back to the developmental plan, yep. does that mean like uh, going back and forth uh, setting expectations of what skills they're developing or is it more their career development? or? So actually, it's a, little, it's a little of both, but what I was referring to was if you, know, if, you had, if you assessed somebody, let's say, or you found out these are the, these are the needs that I think where they, where they need help, I need to focus on those. Each, let's say each month, pick something else to work on. If you find that your sales cycle is getting longer and longer, we have all this stuff in the pipeline and nobody's getting an answer on this stuff, and we either have to clean it out you know, the truth of the matter is, they can always give us a call back if they want to, but the fact is, the fact that we haven't gotten a decision, let's get this stuff out of there. That means somebody might have a need for approval, and they, they need training, or they need coaching on how to call and say, experience tells me that at this point, if you're not moving forward, that you're not going to move forward. And that's okay. Let me close the file. It could be that. It could be, it could be that somebody... Um, doesn't listen. And it could be that somebody is, uh, I mean, gosh, there's, there's you know, tons of things. It could be that somebody uh, overpresents. It could be that somebody has a, uh, um, doesn't take action quick enough. They procrastinate. I mean, what, what, is, what is it that people need to, to focus on? And that's what we, that's, if you really want to grow the organization, those are some of the things that, that we need to do. So. Oops. 
anyway. Uh, accountability. Accountability. What are the things we can control? And that's what we spoke about a little earlier. What can you control? What can you control in the salespeople? What? Active sales behaviors, activity. Absolutely. That you, can, you can control that. Most salespeople spend their area of flipping the invoices. I don't mean to down. There's a lot of good people out there, too. I don't mean to say that. But we spend a lot of time in area of concern. An area of concern is things that get in the way. We need to be spending our time selling and prospecting. Selling and prospecting. Selling and prospecting with consistency. You know, I was dealing with a company yesterday where one of the guys said, you know, I do want to take all the admin away from somebody. But my fear is, are they really going to use that time? That was a fear. We actually had to speak about that. My fear is I'm going to hire somebody else and take it away, and then they're going to come up with something else. You know? So the good people don't do that. Mm -hmm. The answer, to, uh, we had a conversation with this person, this is, and I, I, I kind of sensed something, right? Had a conversation with this person, and little bit, little came out, believe it or not, that he lived at home. He had sold his house, he lives at home. So what's the incentive? I'm, I'm, I'm just, there's nothing wrong. People have situations in life. But there's no mortgage. He mentioned that he, uh, somewhere along the line, had a financial advisor that had helped him with something and he got some Google stock or something. <laughs> Nothing's going to change. <laughs> because there's, there's really not... Now, what did we find out? He likes team stuff. He, what motivates him is not money. Obviously, you can hear that now. He is not motivated by money. But he is motivated by team. And he wants his team to win. And so now we're talking about putting teams together of this inside sales force. You guys do teams. And, and that really motivated. These guys got onto that. So that, that, that's what motivated him. So there's different things for different people, right? Different people need strokes. Some people, that a boys don't mean anything. Some people were stroke deprived. I, I, I met with an owner of a company that had a lot of turnover and I said, hey Mike, you know, he goes, I, I, they left again. I said, well, I heard you ripped this guy. You know, you got to give him some positive strokes. He says, I'm no good at that. <laughs> I said, well, you got to put that in your cookbook because salespeople have a cookbook which we're going to look at in a minute. Sales managers need a cookbook too. And yet, on the other hand, you have managers that are running around that they're so nice. That's not good either. That's not necessarily good. I'm not saying to be mean or anything, but, you know, you're so nice isn't, isn't helping anybody either. Caring and candid is a good combination. So what are the things that you're going to hold people accountable to? How many referrals and introductions did they ask for in a week? How many, how many did they ask for? Even when they're prospecting and somebody said no. Hey, you know what? Happy with our shipping company. We're in a contract for three years. Nothing I could do even if I wanted to. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having a conversation with me. Is there anybody you know and care about you think I should be speaking to? You know what? You, you could get referrals in places, even when there's a no. But how many are they being held, held accountable to ask for? Right, Kyle? I mean, I look at you, and because I know we do that in, in your firm, you know. By the way, let's go back to a belief system. Somebody might say, I can't ask for referrals. So what's the head trash there? Why wouldn't somebody ask for referrals? Because they're going to act what? Needy. They're going to act needy. They're going to say, hey, you know what, I gotta, I, I, hey, I, I, I've had this client for 30 years. I'm going to go ask him for a referral now. They're going to think something's wrong. But what if you changed your mindset? And your mindset said, you know, the more people I meet, the more people I can help. Right? The more people that don't know about me, the more I'm hurting other people. Right? What if you had a cure for cancer and you didn't reach out and, and try and find other people. Now, that's a pretty extreme example, but I, I don't like to necessarily go there. But I'm just saying, if there's something you had conviction for in your, in your company, it's a shame on who if you're not reaching out. Holding people accountable for referrals and introductions, walk-ins, I mean, you know some of these things. But these, these are, by the way, in a technology company, 
you can have a big problem if you're just measuring demos. I went to a technology company where everybody was like, I don't have time for training. Why not? We're doing demos. We're required to do these demos. And they all take 45 minutes each. And I'm exhausted at the end of the day. Because they were measured on demos. Not qualified demos. Demos. And when we started working together, they were like, I feel so relieved that I'm talking with people who are actually going to make a decision on if we're going to move forward or not. Qualified proposals, closes. These are things, how many networking events do people go to? Good ones, the right ones. Not, I, I, ask, I ask this of people sometimes, they go, oh yeah, I go, to my, I go to my trade organization. If you're in real estate, they go into the real estate association. You're not going to find anybody there. Networking. I asked John Kramer, who does credit card processing, I said, John, what's your business? You're, you're in the credit card processing business, aren't you? He goes, no. I go, what do you mean, no? He goes, I'm in the networking business. I happen to have grown my business in credit card processing because I'm in the networking business. Fair statement, right? But, you know, he could be in New York at 7 a.m., he could be somewhere at 10 p.m., he could, you know, and that's, but that works for his business. Many of us are cold calling, fine, fine. But what's the mix? Three foot rule. Whenever you're within three feet of somebody, have a conversation, you have an obligation to have an arm's length, have a conversation with them. You never know who you're going to meet. Met a guy one day, I'm going out networking. I'm out networking, I go to this event, last car in the parking lot, you know, whatever, way in the back. Distinguished gentleman starts walking, another distinguished gray haired gentleman starts walking. What do you do? I go, oh my God, I better start talking to somebody. He's within arm's length. Said, what do you do? He goes, well, I, uh, I own the uh, seventh largest uh, independently owned real estate company in New Jersey. And uh, he said, what do you do? I said, oh, I, I deal sales and sales management training for entrepreneurial driven companies and firms. Typically, owners come to me when they say, you know what, I wish my salespeople were in front of enough new prospects on a consistent basis. And others say, hey, our sales cycle's getting longer and longer. I don't know what to do about it. And other people say, hey, the business has been commoditized. But my guess is that seventh largest in New Jersey, you never have any of those issues. He said, what, are you kidding me? Became my next client. A 30 second commercial, a crafted 30 second commercial that you can, that's going to come out of your mouth, out of your salespeople's mouths. If you would ask your salespeople, what's your 30 second commercial? What would they all say? Right? Uh, we do uh, insurance for all your needs. You know, I'm not busting you guys, I know you're not like that. Um, I, nobody's laughing. I am not kidding with you guys, I just happen to have used insurance as, a, as an example. Um, workshops, seminars, um, do, you do, do you do educational workshops and, and, and seminars? Right? Do you do any of those at trade shows and do you do any of those? Caesars, chief executive semi-annually review. Are you, going, are, you with, are, are you going to meet with the chief executives of the companies that are your clients two times a year and reviewing? Are you existing, existing client touches, cross-selling opportunities? But we got to track them. This is just an example of, of you know, if you want to make five. Do you have these metrics with your people? If you were to make 500 dials and you got 250 contacts, I know there's voicemail and all that, but let's just say that you're in an industry where you can have these conversations. You had 100 meetings, two and a half meetings a week, and you did a proposal once a week, and you had a $100,000 sale. Do you have these types of things that you can lay out? If, in other words, if I could say, this is your personal goal, in order for you to have that lake house, Matt, in order for you to have that vacation, in order for you to have that, this is what your cookbook would need to look like. And that's what you're trying to look at. Most people don't know how to identify an ideal candidate. Too much emphasis on the, on, emphasis on the gut. And this is the best that I can get. I would just say this, I'll just, I'm going to move on a little bit. It's an important part. But if you're trying to hire an A player, you've got to know exactly 
not a self-starter, motivated person who wants to earn money. I mean, I really got to know where has this person grown a territory? Has this person have phone experience? Has this person, I mean, you really got to take some time and figure out the right person. How many of you guys do do a hiring tool? Before you meet with somebody, you're assessing them with an online tool. Abby, in HR, right? Abby's in HR. So, so what that does is it helps you provide an objective, an objective view before you meet somebody. Because we, typically what we do is we find out, I love this person, and I'm hoping this thing really looks good. And even if it doesn't, it's wrong. And I'm going to hire this person. And so I'm suggesting that there are some very good hiring tools. We use one. You may use one. It's fine. But that's what you're going to use your plan. That's what you're going to, you're going to find out all the warts somebody has before you hire them. And that's very, very important. And you can sniff things out on the phone. By the way, your resume, really got to sift through that resume and look for the junk. Yeah? Which screening tool do you recommend? I, I, it's going to sound self-serving, but I have one. It's called Divine, and that's, that's what we use. Divine. Yeah, yeah. But that's, 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 you know, that's, that's what I do. If, you want, if, if it's of interest to you, I'm, I'm happy to speak to you about it. Um, and, but check out the phone interview. Here's the phone interview. Most people do a blue sky the job phone interview. Hey, how are you? We're a great company. You know, one of the largest in the region. We, uh, we're a great company to work for. We're going to give you, we're going to give you leads. We're going to give you, you know, they blue sky the job. Here's what my, here's what my, I do, I do this with companies. I work as an outsourced sales manager in many companies. And so here's my interview. Here's what it'll sound like. Oh, hey, oh, hey, 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 Joe, uh, hey, thanks for giving us a call today. Hey, listen, we've got 60 resumes here. We're about to, it's a very popular position. We've got a lot of people to speak to. We're going to take about five to ten minutes and, and ask each other some questions and see if it makes sense to continue speaking. Is that okay with you? Uh, you, you know, now, is somebody ready? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Right? Now, it could be, yeah, sure, go ahead, fire away. So you've got to ask questions as if you were the prospect, not as if you're somebody who's hiring, not as if you're in the employer, because you want to see what they're like in the line of fire. Right? But most people are, hey, listen, you know, send me a resume, let's take a look. You know, so it's, you're, you're really, you know, what, what, you know, what makes you think, what research have you done? You know, I, I did one with a kid, somebody the other day. I think they were looking up the company online. It was awful. What can you tell me about the company? You are a... Uh, that's awful. You can sniff. Well, that was done. Right? Anyway, there are different ways to do it. Ask somebody, what's the most you ever made? Why, why would that be important? Hey, what's the most you ever made? What does that say? Their success. Success. Find out their potential. Their potential? Find out... Are they on their business? You guys as owners and managers know what you shipped, what's, what's in stock, what's, what's your profit, what, right? You know that. How about somebody, shouldn't they know their business? Uh, I think it was back in uh, 2007, I think it was eight, uh, before, eight, uh, seven, before everything happened. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, you know, so that, they're not on top of their game. They don't care about money. And you know, other people are motivated by different things, but the fact of the matter is the best salespeople really are motivated for money. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have any that aren't. You got to find out what does motivate them, but so that phone screening is very important. And what you're going to do is you're going to rate them on their warmth, are they articulate? Do they? Here's one for you. Great, we'll give you a call if somebody says, "Okay, look forward to hearing from you." I mean, try. I mean, they do this all the time, all the time. And these are people with resumes that got sales and grew a territory. And they didn't try and close us. All right, we'll give you a call. We'll let you know. Okay, great. Hope to hear from you. But is that what you're going to do when I have you sitting here and I'm paying you a salary? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you find that some of the phone interviews now are using maybe like Skype or video type stuff where you actually can see the person's body language? And you... you know what? We haven't done many of those. It just didn't seem like a need. You know, I'll tell you why. Because I really... Um, the, the, the companies that I've worked with, they, they're not doing it with their customers. So I just want to see what it's going to sound like on the phone. Right? But if it was the other way, yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, onboarding. I mean, what do you do? You know, are you onboarding these people the right way? Or are you just saying, hey, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a cubicle, take a phone, uh, you know, you'll learn. Yeah. Going, yeah. going back one sec to... Sure. So, 
like we're interviewing for some salespeople now, right? Yep. I get. I'm like everybody else. I say we were hiring for for attitude. And, yes. And of course, we always the finalists always are in the industry, right? Yes. But one of the things you, you get like literally 200 resumes. Yes. What do you suggest we look for? Because before they get to my desk, an HR person is is going through it and then yes. asking me which ones I want her to phone interview first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest we look at when you literally have like 200 like that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, what I would suggest is that we, we, my my suggestion is this: you know, you take these columns and you we, you you put we call it search. So you're saying these are my skill. These are the skills I'm looking for. These are the experiences that I'm looking for. These are the attitudes that I want. These are the results that I'm, I, this person should have achieved. These are the cognitive skills that I believe they need to have in this job. And these are the habits they should have experienced, they should bring to the table. And I would brainstorm yours of what you think you really need. But when I would look at these resumes, I would make sure that it's somebody where there are you know, some metrics there. They, if you're looking for a hunter, they grew a territory. If you're looking for a maintainer, you know, they expanded. I think you, know, you want to look at, you have to match it to what your search criteria is. But you have to give some thought to that. And what must they have, and what might they have? Let's talk about a sales process here for a couple minutes. Buy or sell or dance. Prospect system. Appear interested. Hey, you know, sounds pretty good, storage for documents. And that's something that I think, uh, you know, we've been tripping over boxes over here. You know? How's that, right? Okay. So they appear interested. Person goes, salesperson, okay, the top one is the prospect, bottom one is the, is, the, is the salesperson. Conduct a needs analysis. Or let me come in and take a look at your technology. Let me come in. Could always be doing better, right? Uh, looking for better document. You, know, you do storage, you do document solutions. Let me come on in, let me do a needs analysis. By the way, is it a truthful? When they appear interested, are they are they telling you the truth? Not always, right? We have a you know it's not in this presentation, but we sometimes we say prospects lie, and that's not that they're bad people. But why do why do prospects lie? They think people are afraid of rejection, so they don't want they want to be nice. They, they may have their own need for approval. Hey, listen, you know what? You sound like a good guy, right? What else? Keep their just costs down. Keep their costs down. I think they lie. They maybe they'll under. Uh, <coughs> identify what their needs really are, mm -hmm. and then the reality is that they need more than they really want. Okay, fair enough. So they, they lie in that way. They're just finding more information. They've got no interest actually by from Absolutely. From they, they want more information. Absolutely. So they lie. Hey, listen, sometimes we go to the store. We, we tell little white lies. Walk through Macy's. Can I help you? I oh, know. I'm just looking, right? So, you know, that's, uh, that's part of it. Um, and what do, they, what, 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 do sale, what do prospects think of salespeople? What do they think of them in general? Anybody here putting their kid to bed at night? Right? Anybody, putting your kid to, put, talk, anybody here tucking your kid in at night, right, if you have a small child or whatever, giving a kiss on the cheek and saying, study, study hard, honey, you're going to be a salesperson. <laughs> right? Great profession. We're all doing it. It's a great profession, right? Except you, Kramer. You did that. Is... is, is but that's what, that's what people think, because they, they think that we're like a vulture on a wire ready to come down for some roadkill. That's what they think. We're not, but that's what they think. And therefore, we get treated that way. We get lied to. So we go and conduct a needs analysis. Let me take a look. Let me see what you have. I'll get back to you with a quote. And they act motivated. And what do they want, what do they want from us? I think you said it earlier. They want more information. Right? Want more information. What do I want to pay for that information, by the way? Nada? Zero. Right? We're supposed to go put quotes, proposals, all these things together, and we end up, they don't, they don't want to pay anything for it for our, for our time. If we, so if we don't qualify our proposals, we're putting in a lot of time. And then we go and we give a presentation. So, you know, I, some of you may have seen this. I, just as, for demonstration purposes, that's all. Uh, for demonstration purposes, I... Uh, Mind if I, uh, you've seen these before. You, 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 don't, you don't know what this is? Oh, good. Okay. So anyway, I'll tell you what, Gio. Uh, 
I'm so glad you invited me in. I, I want to show you, you know, you mentioned you had some, uh, some printing issues and, you know, we can really help you. Or you mentioned whatever I have in my bag here, just as a sample. You, you ever do this one? You ever have your salespeople? I know, you probably not, but I'm going to be in your neighborhood, right? What do you do when somebody says, I'm going to be in your neighborhood Tuesday at 10 or Thursday at 2, right? And so now you're like, oh my God, a salesperson's coming, right? Right? So, but let's just say, let's just say, I were to, um, hey, Gio, you know, thanks for, uh, for seeing me. I know you're a very busy man. See, I don't have the millionaire attitude in, when you're in, the, when you're in, the, when you're in that, that buyer-seller dance. Because now, let me prove to you that we, 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 you know, we, we make the best chickens in the, in the tri-state area. Just hold the way to that. Hold, let's give it a squeeze, Gio. Would you please give it a squeeze? Yeah. Nobody makes chickens that can actually, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, well, most people put it down by now, but <laughs> hang on to it, you're good. Okay, now, if you don't like that chicken, we got this chicken, right? Now, this chicken has the biggest storage compartment out of any in the, in the tri-state area. Now, if you don't like that chicken, we've got this, uh, you can blow this chicken up. Okay, now, yeah. R&D is working 24-7 because, you know, this one is an anti-slip chicken. You walk by. And, you know, you're not going to slip because it has different nubs on it. And it's really good. The cooking channel, you know, QVC, they're really selling like hotcakes. Now, if you don't like that one, we have this one. These are hand cut in, in uh, excuse me, by a tailor in Italy, right? These are not made in, in China by machinery. Uh, this one here is actually a latex-free chicken. If you have a latex salary, this, this is actually a, uh, a kosher chicken. Um, and this one here is, this one is actually a, uh, a vegan chicken, if you will. So now, if you don't like that, we have this. Uh, by the way, we can match this to any of your Pantone colors. You know, back, back to, we got six million colors back in the office on our computer. So if you don't like that, we, we like that. Now, uh, if, you, now if, if money is an issue, because, you know, I mean, price these days, you know, a lot of people looking at that, you know, and of course we got these as well. So. So what we do is, we go in and we over-present, right? We, we present and we, we try and convince. Because I got a lot of people calling me and telling me, hey Dan, if I could just help my people with their pitch, right? It's not, it's not the pitch, it's everything that you're doing prior to the pitch, which I'll share with you in a second. So they try, they try to obtain, obtain more information and then you attempt to close. So what does your close sound like? Now what do you say? How about this one that you always hear? ABC. How many times do I meet people? ABC, Dan. Always be closing. Always be closing. I mean, don't, don't people sniff that out? And where are they going to go? Where are they going to go when they feel they're being closed? Go in the opposite direction. And that's when they avoid commitment. Then you're not going to get a commitment from them. It's going to be, I'm going to think about it. I'll let you know. We'll see. There are no clear next steps. <coughs> And then we try and handle stalls and objections. And we think they're disguised as stalls and objections, and very often it's the slow no. And then they disappear. They go into the witness protection program. Right? You get that, that consolation prize, their uh, lifetime subscription to their voicemail. And then we go and we follow up. How about this one? I, I, what's a good skill for a salesperson? Follow up, follow up, follow up. It is, if it makes sense, if you have a clear understanding of what's going to happen next. It does make sense. It doesn't make sense if you're just following up and you just, you just, you just don't know it. So, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of bring us full circle with the selling system here. This is our submarine. And the submarine is below the surface. You can't see a submarine coming at you. Fair statement? It's, it's, it's stealth. And we always say, if you, if you feel like you're being sold, if that person can feel like they're being sold, you're not doing something right. And so, what's our strategy for developing bonding and rapport with another human being? What's our strategy? If I were to ask you, what is your strategy for developing uh, 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 trust? So I go to a big payroll company one day. I just, you know, I, 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 it was in the city, I went in and they had a whole bunch of salespeople there with no pen and paper and leaning back and H I'm thinking they, this is what the HR department hired I mean you know really you know and they're all sitting back and I said guys I'm going to talk to you today about having a selling system you guys have a selling system uh, I, God is my witness God is my witness uh, yeah 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 they sent us down to Miami uh, and they trained us for three days I said well what's your first step in your system Rust? I think it was trust. I said, well, that's good. How do you do it? Uh, be nice? 
And so that's good. Good salespeople are nice people. Not all nice people are good salespeople. That's, that, that, that was, that's what they called training. What is your strategy? Is it, is it finding, hey, nice picture on the wall? Or, hey, how's the weather out by you? I mean, it's okay, but that's not gaining trust. That might be breaking the ice. What's your strategy for developing trust? What's the, what, can you identify what the behavioral style is of your prospect? Are they a driver? Are they an interactor? Or do they, do they want small talk? Do they want detail? We have to adjust. We have to adjust and know how we communicate so we can communicate with them. But there's many other ways to build rapport. What's your, we call it an upfront contract. What are the agreements that you have with your prospect as what's going to happen on this phone call? Or what's going to happen during our meeting? And what are the, the decisions that are to be made? All right, Steve? Hey, Steve, you know, the objective of our call today is to determine if perhaps I can help you with your, with your, uh, uh, with your insurance for your business. I know, uh, you, know you, you had mentioned to me on the phone that a lot of things have changed and that you don't hear from your agent except for when it's renewal time. So can I make a suggestion? Let's take a step back, ask each other some, some pretty straightforward questions. And, and, and by the way, if you think there's no fit here at any point, this is important. If you don't think there's a fit here at any point, I hope you'd be okay telling me there's no fit. Could, could you do that, Steve? This is the role playing. Right? This is yes, this is no. So, 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 um, so Steve, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and you know why, Steve? Because a lot of times people tell me they want to think it over. I found I'm the only one thinking it over. So if you could, and, and equally as important, if we think there's a fit, we could take out, we could take out our calendar, pick another time to get together, and review a few policies that might make sense for you, and at which time you can make a decision then. Would, would that be a fair agenda for today, Steve? So you know, you gotta take control of the call, and not just show up and make a presentation. Same thing when you have upfront contract on a call. Hey, I'm not sure that I should be speaking with you today, Kyle. Would it make sense if I took 30 seconds and told you why I called? Sure, go ahead. All right? Hey, it's Kyle from Sax Macy. Uh, is Sax Macy from uh, BST? Does my name ring a bell? No, no, it doesn't. Don't worry. We never met. See, I want to do something that's going to change your mindset. If I sound like a salesperson, I'm going to get treated like one. So upfront kind of pain. What is pain? What's the definition of pain? A little exercise. Take on a, on a little piece of paper, whatever you got, scrap piece of paper. Write down on the left side, what are the top three reasons people should buy from you? Top three reasons people should buy from you and your company. Why they should do business with you. Top three reasons people should do business with you. Got it? Got it? All right. Now, I hope it never happens. God forbid. But let's just pretend your company goes out of business or you've been fired. And you now work for your biggest competitor. Top three reasons people should buy from you. Oh, same? Done already? Also, Matt? Yeah, the same. So let me, what are your three, Matt? Uh, knowledge, track record, and uh, ease of uh, interaction. Okay, fair enough. Is it safe to say, Matt, that your competition is not out there saying, listen, I just want to let you know, <laughs> you know, we'd love to do business with you, but we're not easy to work with. But we do not have a track record. And what was your third one? Uh, they're not knowledgeable. And we just got in the business yesterday. We don't know our head from a hole in the wall. And no, nobody's saying that. Fair statement? Right? Fair statement? So we're out saying the same thing to everybody. So unless we're going to be good, I promise you, if you can get good at listening and understanding pain, pain is personal, compelling, emotional reasons why somebody needs to make a change. That's what it is. But we, as salespeople, we end up being the pain, not getting the pain. And so we need to learn personal, because nobody's changing anything unless there's a compelling, personal, emotional reason to change. And I have to know that before we do a quote or a proposal or send swatches, or all these other things. And then, let me ask you a question. How committed are you to taking care of that pain, Matt? I mean, the fact that you are importing garments and the salespeople don't know what's in the warehouse and production doesn't know when this is going to land, and I, I can't, it's probably impossible to put a 
get your arms around how much that might be costing your organization? Is that a fair statement, Matt? Fair statement. So, what, what if, you don't have to give me a pie in the sky, but let's pretend, what would that number be? I won't hold you to it. I don't know. So you come up with a number. Million dollars. Right? Matt, I don't know, but how, how, how committed are you to making an investment in a piece of software that could come in, you know, how committed are you to fixing this a million dollar problem? Right? You gotta quantify the pain. Most people aren't doing that. They're not asking what's the commitment. How committed are you to change? They're not talking about how much this might cost. How much are you willing and able to invest? And how about this one? The decision making process. What's your process for making a decision on moving forward with a 100, with a, to, 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 to fix a million dollar problem, Matt? I mean, so what's your process? I, you know, one guy, one young guy started my program, came into the class, it was before Good Friday, after Good Friday, he goes, boy, I was going to have such a good weekend. I said, what, what happened? Oh, I went home at 2 o'clock, they said, the business was mine. I said, okay, well, why do you think it was yours? And she, he said, because, she said, all she had to do was run up by a few other people. <laughs> but how, how, how often do we actually get lulled into a false sense of security Instead of saying, can I ask you a question? When you say you've got to run it by a few other people, who are these other people? And my guess is that they already have vendors that they're already happy with. What are they going to say when you come and you say you've got somebody new you've never worked with before? I mean, you've got you to spend time on these things. The fulfillment step is a presentation. So what we do, this is qualify, present, and close. Qualify, close, and this is traditional selling. We qualify, we present, and we try and close. What we do is we qualify, we're closing. Our close is not a, how would you want to move forward? It's we're working together to help with the solution within the budget that you have, that you're committed to fix, to the appropriate decision makers, knowing how you make a decision. It's closing along the way. So I would say that what most traditional sales processes do is they qualify hard, excuse me, they qualify easy and they close hard. And my suggestion to you is to qualify very hard and close easy. So put the up front, do the work up front. But you can't do it if you're not feeling good about yourself, if you don't know how to do it, if your people don't know how. And then we have something we call the post-sale step and that's preventing a back out, in case you ever had that. And also setting expectations for, uh, for future. Uh, future expectations to do business together. So these are some of the other things. We'll move along, but you know, other management processes you should be aware of and doing. CRM, this guy here, right? Matt could help a lot of folks with that. Uh, joint sales calls, how often do they fall apart when you go in with somebody that's on a different page than you? And I'm bringing in the boss or I'm bringing in the technical person and you go, oh my God, I got this far. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe it. So it's not rehearsed. Nobody knows their role. And it could be a big mess. So these are personal goals of your salespeople. <coughs> Continuous performance evaluation improvement. I mean, it's about continual growth. And compensation does drive behavior. It does. Certainly training can help. Just want to share this with you. You know, if you were to do an assessment, you know, this is the type of assessment we use, but there's different four flavors of salespeople. And sometimes you can go get an assessment and you can say, uh, oh, you know, this person says that they can, you know, they're, they're good or they're bad or whatever. But just keep in mind that, you know, this is the kind of salesperson you guys were talking about. Unique value. You have to have the ability and the the skills, the mindset to sell something unique. It's a different skill set and it's fine to sell something that's a commodity. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, but it's a shorter sales cycle. It's about a quick re building a relationship quickly and controlling and closing. And if you're in commodity business, you want to find somebody that fits that profile. If you want an account manager, it's fine. Different skill set. Consultative sales, um, 
you know what, it's tough these days. I mean, it's because that's a person who's going to take their time, and what you really want to do, you do want to challenge somebody these days. You do want to, you do, you got to be able to plant your feet. You got to be able to probably do some of these other things here, unless you're in a very big, long sales cycle, big ticket item. So my question to you, commitment. Just food for thought for you as, you, as, we, get the, as we approach the end here. You know, how committed are you on a scale of 1 to 10 to, to change? You know, to, 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 to shed your skin, to do some of the things that we spoke about today. Or to say, you know what, I'm not that committed. By the way, what does commitment mean? Anybody know, what's a true definition of commitment? Came up with one a while back I happen to like. Find not everybody fits it, but that's okay. What's the definition of commitment? Anybody? Dedication to something? Doing something, um, doing what you said you were going to do, even though the mood you set it in has changed. Doing something you said you're going to do, even though the mood you had set it in has changed. And it's difficult, and you may even be afraid. But that's commitment. Because we all set goals, we all get grandiose ideas. And now here we are, it's time to, to execute, right? So that's, that's what commitment is. Or doing something even though you don't feel like doing it. Right, so on a scale of one to 10, how, are you ready to change? Are you ready, where's your leadership? Are you ready to take even more leadership and help change in your organization? Do you have realistic expectations? You know, where's your organization now? Are they in denial? Your salespeople in denial? Uh, resistance, this is how people change. Deny it, resist it, explore it. Make a commitment to something. Work your way there. Come up with a systematic action plan, some clearly defined objectives. Communicate more in your company. I believe that you, you might find you, meet, you need to do that. Progress, monitoring, and feedback. Write down, just as a result of our session today, what are, what are three things that are required by you? in order to become a sales-driven organization or more of a sales-driven organization. <coughs> Write down three things. And then what priority are they? Yeah, sure. Good. What are you? What, what are you? Based on what we spoke about today, right? What's required by you, by your management team, by leadership? What's required in order to become a more sales driven, a, 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 to go to the next level as a sales driven organization, or, or become more effective? What are three things that you would need to do? That you, action steps, let's say, that you would want to take, that you would want to have happen, that you need to take action with. And which one, and then just prioritize. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. And let's just hear a couple. For, uh, I, I, we, all, we all learn from each other, so I, I, I find. Mm -hmm. Get the vision, have a vision, know where you want to go. So people, people want to buy into something, want to know where you're going. Good one. What else? Anybody? Uh, some of the goals. Okay. Some of the you know, different goals as far as like uh, having your things planned, number of calls. Okay. Something like that. Today. All right, then you got to hold people accountable to them too. You know, set the time out. Coaching, it's a big thing. How often are you coaching your people? Do you have a set of questions that you're coaching them with? What are you doing to grow them? Anybody else? Change. Change? Okay. Good. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, I put, uh, so I put goals. I put process, and then I also put review. Review of the process. So mm -hmm. they sort of continually feed each other. Okay. How to 
formalized process and then have a period of time where you review the process and its success, mm -hmm. whether it needs to change as well. Okay, works. Anybody else? Just a quick one? Yeah. Basically the same thing. Accountability, goal setting. Accountability, goal setting, all these types of things. Okay, yes. Yeah, along the same lines, I, I put down behaviors, but um, timeliness to those behaviors. Mm -hmm. Meaning you don't want to be you know, looking to figure out who to call on Monday morning or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. to play accordingly. Yeah, if you're trying to figure that out, it's probably not the best time to do it. It's going to cut into your, your time. Very true. So, um, yeah. If you got, you know, that piece of paper that you had when you first came in, um, could you just take that out? Because I just want you to circle something and I, I want to hand it in to me or to Zach in the back, who, nice young man who's working with me today. Uh, hey, stop it. Uh, not you, it was him. Um, but I, I would like you to write so that I know, you know, what's a lesson that you learned? Just write down the lesson that you learned, you know, so that I know that, and, and then I'll tell you what the, what the next thing means. What's a lesson? What's a lesson that you learned? What are you going to do? I mean, I know we just mentioned a little bit in the last exercise, but <coughs> what's a lesson that you learned? And then the last thing is, just so that I know, um, you, you've got you have a yes, uh, a, a TIO, and, and, and a no. Well, anybody know what TIO stands for? Think it over. Think it over, right? We were just talking about that before. So do me a favor, cross that out. <laughs> just cross that out. Um, if you'd like to hear from me, if you like me, I, listen, I, thank you so much for spending the morning. I know how busy everybody is. I hope I gave you some tidbits to go back and to, and to start to implement. If you'd like me to give you a call, if you want to hear from me and set up a time to get together. Uh, many of you were referred, uh, others were, were getting to know each other. If you'd like me to give you a call and you'd like to get together and sit down uh, face to face and, and see if I can help your organization the way that I've helped others, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to carve out time out of my calendar and, and come and meet with you if you'd like me to. So please circle a yes if that's what you'd like. And if you say, hey, Dan, you know, I, I enjoyed what I heard today, uh, but I'd rather you, you not give me a call, it's perfectly fine. And, and that's okay, too. And I do hope to see you again. And I hope to, uh, to network with you and, and see you around. Dollars, What's that? $10 million in the bank. <laughs> it's <So>. perfectly fine. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Um, because, you know what, if you're the type of person who says, you know what, I don't want to hurt the guy's feelings, and then he go home and he go, shoot, he's calling me now, don't worry. Just put, put the no. I could go on and on with the no. Just put the no. It's okay. It's okay. But if you'd like me to call and you want to sit down and have a serious business conversation, see if I can help you, ha happy to do that. Either way is fine. With that being said, let me, if you can collect the cards because it's, it's veto time, you know, if you want to uh, just pass that around to the tables, please. And what do we got? Oh, a WA, it's going to be a WHM, and it's going to be Scott Litchfield wins a book. Congratulations, Scott. All right. <laughs> so just a, um, anyway, guys and gal, um, just want to thank you uh, once again for uh, coming and spending the morning with me. Appreciate it very much. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'll just collect and Zach will collect and thank you. Appreciate it.